We are officially broadcasting. Hey, welcome, guys. Welcome. Hello. I still don't see anyone keep populating the channel on oh, my they're end. Com so. they're, they're coming in. 28 people oh, so far. 20 oh, there minutes. it is. There it is. I see it now. Yeah. There it is. Now, now it's a party. Look at all those attendees. <laughs> Well, perfect is everybody's rolling in. Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of SEO for Publishers. We've officially been doing these monthly webinars for six months now. That's wow. Geez, so sorry, guys. Wow. Can't believe you guys don't have anything else to do. Goodness. Right? <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us today. As you're rolling in and getting settled in, in the chats, please let us know where you're tuning in from. All right. You think after all this time we'd be able to figure? Hey, look, there we go. Amy's back from Orange County. Amy, how you doing? Represents. Yeah. Oop, 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 oop. Aaron from Fort Worth. Buenos Aires. Paula back from Buenos Aires. Yep. Just we just spoke. Paula and I just spoke a little uh, this month, actually. All right. Yeah. Got Sydney, Australia on the call. Spain. UK. Look at that. Fantastic. Look at all these other states on oop. lockdown. Hey. If you're on lockdown <laughs> right now, let us know in the chat. We're uh, greetings from Purple Tier, San Diego County. I know that Ashley is in Oregon where they have locked down too. So we are, it's good, good to go. My kids are loving it. Yes. <laughs> it's fantastic having teenagers when they're in lockdown. Oh, it's really we good. We got some, some more people, lot, lots of people from Spain. And Australia. Philippines. Oh, Philadelphia, not Philippines. <laughs> yeah, Amy's, Amy's in the purple tier too, so she knows all about that. Good times. Argentina. Yeah. Ooh, we've got two, two folks from Argentina then. It's amazing. Man. Wow. Yeah. We're worldwide. Yeah, really. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Today we're going to be talking about Google's core web vitals with our amazing expert panelists, Casey Marquis, Arsene Rabinovich, and Andrew Wilder. We'll be having a QA and a at the end, so please feel free to drop any questions in the Q&A section. Um, it's on the right-hand side of Zoom. You can also throw them in the chat, but preferably in Q&A. Uh, we may stop and address it if it's on top of If not, we'll get to it at the end when we open up for Q&A. So let's get started. Let's figure out this whole Google's core web vitals mess that we're gonna have to deal with here. Andrew, should we be scared? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shut down your blogs. Sorry. No. Stop it. No, actually, I don't, no, you should not be scared. Um, and I, I think actually you should, everyone should see this as an opportunity. Um, it, you know, if you're, if you're on this call with us, uh, you know that this is important and you're going to have a competitive advantage because you're ahead of the curve. Um, we still have time. And this is an opportunity to basically um, improve your site in a way that will help you with their search, rank search rankings. So I think instead of being scared, it's better to see it as an opportunity. Way to be optimistic. I love it. Very good. Love <laughs> it. Love it. Can, you, can you break it down and explain what Core Web Vitals are and kind of the history of them? Absolutely not. It's too complicated. We're just going to, we're going to do a puppet show for you <laughs> Next guys. Next question. No, no, we're... <laughs> So here's the thing. Um, the reason Google came up with these core web vitals is site owners were too were, were tired of having performance gurus tell them what they needed to measure about quality performance. So instead, Google's decided we're going to do this for you and try to dumb it down as much as you can. And so the web vitals, the, 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 the web vitals initiative, as it was called by Google, and is it an attempt to make this landscape less murky, a little simpler for everyone on the call? And that's hopefully what we're going to do for you today is kind of break it down. And our goal is to, to allow you to, to focus in on what Google considers the most critical metrics, these core web vitals, at least in their opinion, that you can track and optimize over time, because that's what we want to do. We want to have like a, a benchmarks and we want to show what those benchmarks are. And then we want to try to get as close as we can to those benchmarks. And so Google introduced these core web vitals back in May of 2020. And they're a set of metrics related to speed, responsiveness, and visual stability. And there's three of them. And we're going to go over all those today in detail. The first, those metrics in no particular order are largest contentful paint, which is the time it takes for a page's made content to load. So an ideal 
LCP measurement would be around 2.5 seconds or faster. It, again, simplest way to say, largest contentful paint measures loading. Okay, then we get into metric number two, which is the uh, first input delay. First input delay is the time it takes for the page to become interactive to the average user. An ideal measurement there would be something like less than 100 milliseconds. So first input delay measures interactivity. So how long does it take before the user can interact with the page? Then we get into the third metric, which is the one that's really caused so much consternation and not only with everyone on this call, but in all of our clients in particular, is cumulative layout shift or CLS. And cumulative layout shift is the amount of unexpected layout shift, you know, that kind of happens on visual page content. So when you, you know, when you opt an ideal measurement of that is like less than 0.1, which measures visual. And so if you could say the cumulative layout shift measures visual stability. And I know, can't wait for, for Andrew to jump in on this. Mm -hmm. I know he has a lot to say, but these layout shifts specifically happen whenever a visible entity changes in a starting position. So like if I'm like top and left position is the default writing mode between frames and that stuff moves. Like if I open up a page and you have a logo and that logo is not sized correctly, there's movement as the page loads, especially as it renders on a, on a mobile device. And that causes a shift and that shift to Google is very poor user experience. And we're getting a lot of that. And the CLS metric specifically is impacted by a ton of issues for those of you on the sites running ads. Specifically, we have, you know, if you use fonts that are improperly, you know, if you you have fonts that are improperly displayed, I know Andrew's going to get into this a little bit. He's going to talk a little bit about FOIT versus FOUT, basically flash of invisible text versus flash of unstyled text, which can lead to fonts jumping around. Many of you suffer CLS issues because of embeds or just because of banner ads or iframes. We're trying to minimize those as much as possible. Probably one of the biggest reasons that CLS happens is an inability to specify dimensions and images, which is something else that we're going to talk about today. Or, of course, any content that is dynamically injected on a site. Hey, Andrew, what's an example of content that's dynamically uh, injected on a site? Ads. Oh, my God. Ads. <laughs> Imagine that. So ads are one of the biggest things that you're going to see is going to cause issues with CLS. Now, some ad companies are better than others in trying to fix this, and we're going to review that today. And then, of course, one of the other biggest things that go into CLS or actions that are waiting for a response from the network, you know, before updating the DOM. And the DOM, of course, is the document object model that makes up the page. And I know many of you are like, oh, my God, Casey. Acronym soup. My eyes have already glazed over. What are we going to do? We're going to try again. We're going to try to break this down for you. These three metrics, these three core web vitals. And then we're going to talk about how these three core web vitals are going to be grouped with four other metrics to make up what's called the user experience algorithm that Google is going to has already announced is going to be live next May. So hopefully we'll get into all that today. Perfect. Thank you for that definition. Um, Arson, Google releases updates all the time. How is this one different? And would you say it's more important than some of the recent ones? Um, yeah, because they, they, they announced it. Uh, usually Google doesn't come out and tell us that they're doing an update. Usually uh, it just happens and then they let us know uh, uh, post factum, like, oh, we just did this update. Uh, typically Google lets us know uh, about these types of updates or changes to the way they evaluate websites uh, uh, when there's something that we can do about it, right? So like uh, 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 mobile indexing, uh, um, I can't think of another one right now, but basically stuff that like you should be probably getting your site ready for, right? Uh, uh, stuff that's within your control. Um, so how frequently this happens? It, 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 it Google up Google changes its algorithm very frequently. Some I think Mueller said Casey right like once a week if not more right almost on on, on a weekly basis they update the algorithm. Uh, oh. But this this is something that they're giving us time to prepare for. They're letting they're giving us instructions. But again, this is nothing new, right? This is stuff that we've been kind of preaching for a while. And now this is one of those things where Google, again, just like what we saw with the November update, Google is coming out and saying, okay, so you guys haven't been listening. We're now making this a part of the evaluation of your website. 
So they're giving us time, just like with mobile indexing, they're telling us it's going to come into action next year. Uh, um, so now is the time to start paying attention and really, really following the advice that, that, that we're putting out for you guys. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Andrew, let, let's start getting into the technical aspects of this. How does search console validation validation for core web vitals work? Okay, so most of you probably have access to your Google Search Console already. And usually when it sends out an error or a warning, you can click the little validate fixes button. And then it says, it does like a pre-validation for about a minute. And then if it passes that, it then says, okay, validation process has started. And then in a few hours or a few days, it kicks out an email and says whether you passed or not. Um, for, for these, it works a little differently. You can't just validate like that. Uh, because it, it needs to look at real world values from the Chrome user experience report. So if you're trying to validate an issue with your cumulative layout shift, for example, um, and you click val uh, validate fixes, that actually starts a 28 day clock. And so it starts tracking from that point on um, what it's going to look like. And then after your 28 days, it may say um, that your CLS scores have gone down and are much better or may not. Um, so when you're doing optimization, you don't want to constantly be clicking the validate button. You want to do all your optimization, get it as good as you can, and then click the button to re restart the test and then evaluate from there. Um, that's not the only tool for you know evaluating CLS. Um, that's just in Search Console. But I just wanted to, uh, there's been a lot of confusion about that um, in terms of validating that one. So I wanted to just throw that out, the, out there and make sure everybody knows that like starts the clock and it, you have to be patient on this stuff. Now I will uh, just very quickly to kind of add in on what he said on what Andrew has said there. Google has a page, and I'm going to go ahead and paste it over, and it's called the Core Web Vitals Report. And there's lots of little snippets on that that I think all of you would find of value here. And, and if you scroll down through that, there's a couple things that you need to be aware of, including, of course, as Andrew said, when you click validation on this. We've had clients come to us and say, "Well, Casey, I was in the account, I saw some errors, and then I checked next week." And there weren't any errors and I didn't do anything. Andrew, if you actually run across that where we've actually seen issues saying, okay, there were red errors there, but I didn't validate and now those are yellow or, oh, hey, I had some yellow errors there and now they're green or they're not there anymore. I've only run across it a couple of times, but basically what's happening there is Google is helping you out. It's possible that you've made borderline changes to your pages without having to do anything on your part to let Google know about it, but they found those changes. And when that happens, they specifically say that there is examples where we will go in and we will rerun reporting at our end without your notice. And if we see that you've made these changes or you've made a big change, like, for example, something switching their networks, like here's a good example, Arson, if you're on Wix and you switched from Wix over to WordPress and you made a lot of changes to your page speed that were very noticeable, especially for, uh, especially for uh, Google with uh, Chrome UX uh, history that they pulled from your um, search confirm your analytics, you would most likely see big changes in data collection in Search Console. So if you go in and take a look at this report here, and I think I let me make sure that I paste it over here again, there's lots of, of finite examples where Google will say, hey, we, we're going to try to do some of this heavy lifting for you. If we've seen that you've made changes, we've seen that you've made dramatic changes to the site architecture itself, or we've gone in and reassessed your site, you might see us, you know, uh, especially if you're a borderline case, we'll give you the benefit right. of the doubt there. Okay. So th this is clearly, e even with Google's help, this is clearly a, a very big deal and something that we need to prepare for. Arson, how big of a ranking factor do you think the core web vitals are, are going to be? So they're going to be super important. I don't know. I, so I don't know if they're going, I don't know. I can't speak to, to, to them being a ranking factor. Are they a quality signal? Absolutely. Uh, um, Google has come out and said that, and then I'm quoting, I just pulled this up. A good page experience does not overwrite having great relevant content, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Google understands that not all sites are created equally. Not everyone is on WordPress. Not everyone has a CMS that, <laughs> Andrew, what? <laughs> uh, not everyone has access to a CMS that can, and we've worked, we work with some, some, some uh, 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 content management systems, especially on the e-commerce side uh, uh, that don't like, still don't give you a place to add a canonical to a page, right? So like, you're still very limited and Google understands that. And that's why things like schema, right? Having schema on your, on your page is not a ranking factor. It's having schema on your page is not going to help you rank higher in Google. It's 
going to help Google understand what the page is about. It's going to provide uh, a better experience in the search results by you know putting out the the little uh, uh, image, the thumbnails, the snippets, uh, the star ratings, and all of that. But you can still rank at the top of page one without any schema on your site, right? So Google understands that not everyone has access to do all this cool stuff or stuff that's necessary to be done on their website. So I don't think they're going to make this such a strong uh, uh, ranking factor. But then again, I really don't know. But as a quality signal, super important, because again, this all boils down to user experience. And Google wants to make sure that whoever's performing a query on their on, on their platform, the, the top results that they're going, going to engage with are going to be quality, that they're not going to provide a bad experience, because then they're going to start losing market share to other search engines who are doing that. So keep that in mind. It's good to do this. It's important to do this. But fixing this will not make you number one on Google. Yeah, and that's important. Again, this is going to be, I believe that this, uh, again, these core web vitals are going to be grouped with four other ranking factors. Right. And they are going to be part of a larger user experience algorithm. And that user experience algorithm is going to function more like a tiebreaker, very similar to what happened individually with the HTTPS, the mobile friendly things, all of those. Right. Now, this is important, folks, because I know a lot of you on the call are in the food and lifestyle niche. You could be more impacted by this than the vast majority of other niches because your content is so similar. How do I know that? Because today alone, I was targeted on Facebook with three Christmas cookie recipes that were exactly the same from three different bloggers. They were literally the exact same recipe, little bit of a difference here and there, but they were called, they're, they're a very specific approach. Uh, I would even have to go and take a look at it, but it was a very specific kind of Christmas sugar cookie that they were doing. And this is where this user experience algorithm may affect you because if you're competing against another site for the same query and you're relatively equal on a lot of other metrics, maybe they get a boost if their UX experience is better than yours. And that's something to be aware of. We definitely want to make sure that we get this dialed in. So Casey, let's talk about dialing it in and, and what this really looks like. So what's the, if there's only one thing, like what's the absolute top must fix item that publishers need to focus on fixing before May? I would say that I would honestly, because Google has said this repeatedly in everything that they've published about the page experience algorithm and, and Arson just commented on it again. I've even went ahead and pasted over the full quote over here. The full quote that Arson was talking about was, quote, a good page experience doesn't override having great relevant content. However, in cases where there are multiple pages that have similar content, page experience becomes much more important for visibility and search, end quote. This is directly from the announcement that Google gave when they were pushing out the page experience algorithm. This is them telling that, uh, you're, again, your, your quality of your content, how you're presenting is still the, of the utmost value. The rest is a tiebreaker. So I think my advice, especially if you're looking to concentrate on one thing, is taking the rest of them aside. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone on the call knows that you have to focus on these seven metrics. Hopefully, all of you on the call are already mobile friendly. You're already having, you're already doing safe browsing. You don't have any safe browsing notices in your search console. You already moved to SSL, so you've got the HTTPS security dialed in, and you're not using intrusive mobile interstitials. Okay, so if you're on the call and you have a mobile interstitial that's popping up on the first click from Google, you need to cut that stuff out immediately. A lot of incorrect information about that. All mobile interstitials that come up on the first click from Google, even if they scroll down, guys, that's not correct. If you go back to the original announcement from Google, it doesn't matter if there's a delay there. It's on the first click from Google. So if you're going to be using mobile interstitials, they definitely need to be non-intrusive specifically. So Taking that aside, let's say that you've dialed in your three core web vitals, you've dialed in these other four metrics here, the mobile friendliness, the safe browsing, the HTTPS, and you've eliminated all the mobile interstitials. Now we come down to the most important kind of the meat of the issue, which is the quality and relevancy of your content. You know, the general view is that even that all the elements of the page experience are important, but it's still the best content that Google wants to rank. And they're going to prioritize over that, over even some subpar issues on the individual metrics that go into the UX algorithm. So just bottom line, a good user experience doesn't outweigh the quality and relevancy of the content for that query for that user at that point in time. Okay, so mobile 
is that's an issue. User usability, um, how your content is referenced and how relevant it is, that's an issue. But arson can can slow site speed be one of those issues as well. Wouldn't that fall under usability? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, we've all been there. We've all tried to load a very slow website, trying to get a piece of information, and it was very frustrating. Uh, uh, I get this all the time. Uh, dealership websites are notorious for their speed issues. Uh, um, you know, and, and a lot of a lot of recipe bloggers, unfortunately, we we still on all of our audits that we're doing, we're still catching you know page speed issues. Uh, uh, but yeah, you definitely want to work on that, and that's one of the things that. Uh, uh, you should be looking at, you know, I would, I would focus on, uh, you know, if, if possible, and if you're with Andrew, this is already probably being handled for you. Uh, but like removing unnecessary third party scripts, uh, setting up better hosting, uh, uh, lazy loading, uh, removing large, uh, uh, large page elements, or, 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 you know, watching the size of your images, the, 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 not the, the actual physical size, but the memory, the memory size of your images, uh, um, will all help, right? Every little bit helps. Again, it's not it's not the North Star, right? You should still be working on this. You should be working on this, but it's not something that you should uh, uh, um, like drop everything else that you're doing and focus on optimizing for speed. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, Andrew, Van S mentioned on their registration that they get different page speed metrics from Google than tools like Ahrefs. Who should you trust when it comes to looking at your metrics, especially because we're going to be analyzing so many of our site metrics over the next few months, trying to fix things. So specifically for page speed, is, is Google correct? Are these SEO tools correct? Where should you go to analyze your metrics? Um, it's a great question because these are just testing tools. So they run a simulation and then give you a bunch of information so you can go fix your site. So mm -hmm. they all work slightly differently. Um, I like to rely on Google Page Speed Insights first because that's Google. You're going to the source. Um, it doesn't mean it's the only tool to use. Um, and I think it's important, especially for things like cumulative layout shift, using multiple tools is really important. Um, <clears throat> GPSI doesn't always catch all the CLS stuff. For example, if you're using Slickstream on your site, which a lot of people are, are using, it's that film strip that appears at the top that, um, uh, that <clears throat> uh, recommendation engine, like it recommends other posts. That actually appears late in the process. Carl and his team have been really good about not interfering with page speed, but um, in the real world, that can track as a CLS shift uh, or a layout shift um, by the Chrome user experience report, but the GPSI testing tool doesn't flag it. So when you're using GPSI, it'll show the field data at the top, and that's actual real world user data that's from the Chrome user experience report, right? So that's in actual browsers. And then if, if you do that, and then you look at the lab data, uh, the lab data might say 0, 0.0 in all green in the CLS section. But if you look at the field data, you see that there's a shift there. We see that a lot with Slickstream um, in particular. So, so PageSpeed Insights doesn't catch Slickstream. Um, and there are ways to fix Slickstream. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Quite the twin. There, there's ways to fix that one. You basically have to put in the spacer so that when Slickstream loads, it's not pushing the page down because you're, you're shifting the layout preemptively so the user doesn't see that. Um, the film strip at the bottom of, of PageSpeed Insights, if you look at the little thumbnail screenshots, if you compare them, you can see what's happening during the load process. They're really tiny, so they're kind of hard to see. But if you see something where like your, uh, your text comes in and then the next thing it's lower, that's a layout shift, right? So those thumbnails can be really help helpful for identifying what they are. Uh, web page test is another great tool. Um, you can record uh, video with web page test and actually play it back in slow motion. Um, so it's kind of like watching paint dry because it'll be like tenths yeah. of a second, mm -hmm. but that lets you really see what's happening, right? Because it slows it down enough to sort of give you that insight. So you can see that this loads and then this loads and that pushes things down. So you can see what's really going on. So these, the short answer is use multiple tools. Um, in terms of what's important, you know, I'd say the Chrome user experience report is pretty darn important because that's what Google's looking at in terms of rankings, right? So um, it's just, that's not necessarily going to tell you how to fix it. Now you've talked about the, I know a lot of you are probably again, um, alphabet soup here. What is a Chrome user experience report? We've pasted over the information in the chat. The Chrome user experience report is an example of a big query report that you can set up and run uh, on a monthly basis and it will pull in all of your historical information 
from analytics showing how your site is graded on a monthly basis on these various core web vital metrics. Now, for you to make use of this report, you're gonna to have to have access to a Google account and a Google Cloud Project account, but they're very easy to do. As a matter of fact, if you click on the link I've given you, it will go ahead and prompt you to create that cloud account. And then you can go ahead and use the same link to enter your URL and start pulling your own historical data. This is something that I, Arson, Andrew, we include regularly with our reports to clients. How these Google Chrome accounts work is there's always a month lag. So clearly right now, the, the, the newest data we can get is up to the end of October. And then Google runs new Chrome UX data on the second Tuesday of every month thereafter. So when I'm doing a mini audit or a full audit, I will pull the Chrome user experience data over several months and I can look through it and see, ah, oh, look, here's where they worked with Arson. And oh, here, look, here's where we changed hosting from Bluehost to Big Scoots. And look at the jump in the core web vitals. And oh, look here, here's where Andrew and NerdPress went in and, and enabled Cloudflare and did a little bit, uh, a couple issues. So we have that historical record so that we can start looking at these metrics over time. The problem with these core web vitals and the problem with these core, this user experience reports is that Google changed how they measured them from April to May. And so there's a lot of lost metrics. People reached out like, Casey, my core web vitals and everything were great in April. And then they literally fell off a cliff in May or June. And that's because Google changed how they started to measure some of those metrics. So understand that if you're gonna run a, a historical report, kind of just ignore everything before May and look at May, June, July, August, September and start benchmarking from there, that's more. That's a more solid and 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 valid benchmark to use for these core web vitals specifically. Let me let me mention also just this this data that Casey's talking about. It's the same data that's showing in GSC. It's the same data that's showing as the field data in PageSpeed Insights. So it's all the same information. It's just different ways of viewing it. It's just visually you can actually understand it. Right. So it's it's charts, and the chart shows you. Here's a, a month view of your first input delay. Here's a monthly view of your cumulative layout shift. I'm like, oh my gosh, only four people out of 100 are having positive CLS issues, whereas previously maybe five people out of, a, out of 100 were having a good experience. So again, it, it, that's, it's a visual way for you to kind of see a breakdown of improvement overall. So if you're working with someone, maybe you're signed up for a hosting plan or not even a hosting plan, but a blog support plan, um, and they've told you core web vitals are not important, you should get another block support plan. Or if you've asked them about these user experience metrics and they don't know what you're talking about, you should probably get a new block support plan. And I bring this up because I've had this happen over the last several weeks and we've got those people to switch and they're very happy they did. So just be aware of that. This is a business. You wanna pay for the best support you can possibly get. Um, Lots of options out there. If you need some suggestions, we can help you on that. Going back on your data points, Casey, that, that you just mentioned, uh, with checking with Google updates, making the update on the second Tuesday of every month, or not update, but uh, running things through and checking things. So if, if you make changes on your site, you basically need to wait a month to go through and look at the data? Well, we certainly won't be able to see it. Like, for example, as an Andrew will tell you, we could we can make changes for our Google Core Web Vitals today, and we could literally have a hundred percent improvement the very same day. The only way we're going to be able to visually see that is to us, is for us to run the Chrome plugin or to use Light, Lighthouse or to use the Google PageSpeed Insights. But we won't see the aggregate data for at least twenty eight days because that's how long it takes for it to run that collected information. Because you Google use and Google uses an aggregate model. So their goal is to pull and aggregate values across all of your URLs. But that makes sense as well because it could take 28 days for us to get those, most of our URLs re-indexed and reprocessed anyway. So it makes total sense. So then would, and we're diving a little bit deep onto this, but with the holiday period right now and bloggers in particular publishing a lot right now and making a lot of changes to their content, should they wait until January to maybe start addressing this? Or would you still recommend addressing this right away on your site? 
Um, I'm going to give Andrew and Arson a chance to weigh on this, but whenever it's a technical issue, we want to make those changes now because technical issues are one of those things where we can have huge ranking swings on the positive if we make technical improvements because we're making it easier for Google to crawl and algorithmically score our content. So if your page speed is so horrible that you're timing things out or let's say you're on the call and you're running AdThrive and you haven't reached out to AdThrive to turn on deferred ad loading or little things like that, you're going to be shocked at how much better you do by doing little things like that. Those are technical fixes. Or if you know that you, you're failing core web vitals because of issues with your logo or because now you know kind of how to check those, making improvements and all that right now as we go into the busy holiday season is absolutely only going to help you. So in that respect, yes. Uh, thank, thanks for letting us answer that question. Yes, uh, we agree with everything you just said. <laughs> absolutely. Whatever Casey said, it's absolutely true. The times too. Perfect. Um, Arson, is updating a new theme if we're going to start to make the changes now? No, don't update. Don't update a, new, a theme. Even Not right now. I'm kidding. Go, finish your question. Okay. So if you need to update your theme, whether it's a technical issue, a user issue, or you just hate the theme that you're working with now, and you're gonna update it now, is that going to be detrimental or is it going to be more beneficial for you? So uh, changing a new theme is a migration because you're, you're moving to a whole new uh, everything, right? So the code is different, how uh, your content is organized on the page is different different scripts, CSS, JavaScript, um, unless you really, 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 really have to. And we do, we do a crazy amount of migrations per year at Top Ad Rank uh, uh, for, for recipe uh, uh, publishers to like very large brands. And we always say, unless you really, 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 really have to, don't because it's, if it's working for you, and it's making you money and you're ranking at the top of page one for a lot of your queries. This will all shift when you move to a new theme. It's going to come back if the migration is done properly, but it's going to you're going to see a fluctuation in rankings. Google has to recrawl the new site, has to get to know what the new organizational structure is and all of that. If you're considering moving to a new theme to address uh, uh, core web vital issues, you're probably on a really crappy theme right now that you want to switch to a new one to address this, right? Uh, um, so uh, um, I can't speak to a theme. I, uh, Skylar's themes are amazing. Uh, a lot of you guys are on them. Uh, uh, he puts in so much work into them. Uh, and every time we do an audit, uh, there's less and less stuff for us to find just because Skylar is, is implementing a lot of the stuff uh, uh, into the theme. Uh, but I, it's, it's, such a, it's such a weird, uh, uh, thing to do just to address a handful of issues that can be probably fixed with uh, hiring a very smart developer and maybe dumping, you know, a, a few hundred dollars to fix certain things like you know, getting rid of uh, JavaScripts that are not being used on your theme, right? You probably have a theme that has like a, a shopping cart JavaScript somewhere in there and you don't have the need for a shopping cart, but it's still there and it's still being injected into your header, right? So, um, I don't think moving to a new theme is a good idea unless you really, 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 really have to. Are there any themes that you would recommend if a blogger is in a situation? Skylar's themes are very nice. We just had a few calls uh, last week with bloggers who, you know, a lot of times, like, well, not a lot of times, I'm noticing this already, and this is the second year I'm noticing this, that towards the end of the year, a lot of recipe bloggers are coming to us and like, oh, I'm so tired of my theme and I want to do new things and I want to update it. And it's like almost like a, I want to, I want to, uh, uh, do a facelift on my, on my, on my theme. Um, I recommend Skylar's themes, uh, very, a lot. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's weird. You have to know what you're looking at. Just the aesthetic aspect of a theme is not going to be a win all for you. You have to understand what else is in there. Uh, I'm sure Andrew can speak more intelligently on the different themes that are out there right now. I'm not that knowledgeable on theming. Uh, uh but again, be careful when you do this. I would just add, and I, and I want Andrew's opinion on this too, specifically about the Divi, Divi themes and uh, other ones like that that use page builders. See, that's the issue is that most of these themes are come with grouped with page builders. 
page builders add a lot of code bloat. They immediately kind of put you behind the eight ball with regards to excessive resources that load on the page. We can optimize them. It's just harder to do. So we would try to have you not use a page builder. Gutenberg is a page builder. You don't need two of them. Use okay. Gutenberg. Use the blocks. That's literally what WordPress is trying to do is move everyone to Gutenberg, which is the page builder. Honestly, that's what the blocks are. And but before this... Yeah, go ahead, go, Carson. Before Andrew, before Andrew jumps in, uh, um, we just recently analyzed a, a, a site, uh, and this goes with Divi, right? A okay. site that was moved from from one theme to Divi, and then from Divi to a different theme, and now they came to us because all oh, things are just like not functioning right. And then when we started, when I actually crawled through the site and looked at some of the historical content, con some of the historical posts, they still had the Divi page builder code. The, the 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 HTML that wraps around each div, right? Yeah. Being rendered <laughs> as text on page on these posts. And this this poor blogger is like, I don't know why all these posts are tanking. And we're like, well, you have just like all kinds of weird code just showing. It, it came back as having uh, an H tag wrapped around each sentence. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was like an H6 or something. Uh, stay away from, unless you really need, unless you're like an, e, not even e-commerce lead gen and you're constantly producing different types of landing pages and you don't have the money to hire a developer or somebody to build these out for you, then a page builder like Divi or Udesign or any of those guys will work for you. Uh, uh, but for, for, for recipe bloggers, it's unnecessary. Andrew. So um, don't use Divi, no matter who you are. Um, <laughs> It's awful. And uh, there are some page builders that are okay. If you really need a page builder, Elementor is a decent one. Um, the, there's, there's philosophical problems with these page builders. Like Arson was saying, you get locked into them. And especially yeah. if you're using them for your content, that's really hard because then you have to go back and edit your content. So philosophically, I'm opposed to these page builder tools. Um, so I think on the... Um, uh, I, I don't think it's a great idea to go to theme forest, for example, and pick a theme that you think is pretty and then yeah. run with it because the themes that have all these features, you know, they're adding all this extra code to make those features work. So if you're just building a little portfolio site and that's not your core business and you don't need to get lots of traffic, then it's probably fine. Right. But if you're building a food blog or a travel blog and you really, this is your business and you need to be competitive, those just very likely will not cut it. Um, so uh, I think Skylar's themes uh, are definitely a great way to go. Um, they're very reasonably priced. He's also supporting them through the Feast plugin. So as as all of us are figuring out, you know, the CLS stuff or whatever come whatever it is that comes next, Skylar is busy updating the plugin to make sure that the best practices are implemented. And it's so much easier to update the plugin than to update themes. And so he's able to keep actually improving the features there. Um, I think it's worth considering Trellis. Um, they just released their beta. Um, I don't think it's ready for prime time personally. Um, I hope nobody from Media Vine's on the call yet. Um, I but I think it has a lot of potential. I mean, at this point, especially if you're a food blogger, do not switch your theme in Q4 unless yeah, you really no. have to, right? So, um, you know, like we're at the week before Thanksgiving. This is like peak traffic. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? You have better things to worry about. Yeah. So, um, but I think Trellis is is growing. Um, I think Trellis is going to be a very compelling replacement for Genesis, which is kind of being phased out. Uh, Genesis is the parent theme that uh, the Feast themes are actually built on. Um, right now, Trellis only has three child themes and they're not all that pretty. Um, yeah, I know that Skylar is going to be releasing some um, Feast themes for Trellis, correct? I you think so. On that by, by that, or do you know anything about that? I, I, I know he's working on it. I don't know what the state is right now. Um, but it, it's, I think, you know, uh, Trellis is complicated. Building a theme is complicated. So mm -hmm. it's taken them a lot longer than they expected. I know everybody's been like, when can I get in on the beta? Um, and I've worked on a few sites and I think, um, I think it's going to be great. <laughs> um, it may not be there yet, but I think it's going to be. So I'm, I'm excited about what they're building with it. Honestly. Well, I'm excited they correct the issues. I mean, we've, I audited two last spring, early times, tons of issues would not have recommended that to my worst enemy, it is substantially improved, improved now, you know, they're not wrapping everything in heading tags, they're using headings correctly, they've provided some functionality that's that comes standard in things like the feast themes or the or Genesis as a default um, framework, you know, ability to optimize category pages, having featured images, some built in schema when it makes sense. But yeah, again, um, 
the only concern I have with Trellis is that they tend to they tend to optimize for their own plugins first. The goal, of course, is to make sure that everything works with what you have. You should not have to change everything about your site to make Trellis work for you. It should be the other way around. Trellis should work as much as possible with widely accepted best practices. And that's always been something that we've struggled with, with Mediavine specifically, is that uh, create, uh, grow, um, these other plugins that they have, they, they tend to have more issues than their competitors because they literally design them to work well with each other, but not with their neighbors. And hopefully that's something that we can see an improvement on with Trellis and as we enter 2021. And I, I also just to, to go on, the, continue the spectrum of theming real quick. Um, if you're at the point where you're ready to hire a designer for a custom theme, then speed and accessibility should be a big part of that conversation. Um, you should be looking at samples of other themes that they've built and running mm -hmm. them through GPSI testing and seeing yeah. how fast they are. Um, you know, those web are, may not yeah. have total control because the user might have added a, another plugin that slows things down, but um, you can put that stuff in your contract. Right. You can say there needs to be, you know, the CLS needs to be 0.0, .0 when tested on web page test and GPSI. Like so uh, and a good developer will actually lead with that stuff. Right. They're going to they're going to say, oh, yeah, we're on top of this stuff. So don't worry about it. Um, so if you're shopping for a custom theme, I think it's something to, to pay attention to. Yeah, the custom themes are a tough thing. I mean, we like I. <sighs> I mean, we get it all the time. Like, oh my gosh, Casey, should I, should I, could I, should I invest $20,000 on a custom theme? <sighs> it's a lot of money. You think of how many ports goods I can buy with that. And I tend to tell bloggers, you know, if you're going to make that investment, it better be, they better going to be there long-term for you. Because the worst thing you can do is tie yourself to a designer who makes a theme and then have the designer disappear. It'd be very hard to reach. And let me tell you, I won't mention any names. That is an absolute issue in the food blogging niche. You pay for issues on a custom theme, and then it's very hard to get this designer to come back and make small edits or to make changes to update that site for accessibility or best practices. And that's why if you're going to get a custom theme, you want to work with someone who's built in on a fully supported now on a, on a framework like Genesis. We tend to recommend Genesis as a, as a, as a, as a framework, and then you build on Genesis with, with custom features. That's what Feast does. That's what Bill Erickson does. That's what, uh, you know, I believe that Madison Weatherwell, is that how you pronounce her last name? I always screw it up. I believe that she works with Genesis and she builds on Genesis. That's what we're looking to do. Uh, the days of having these full custom themes hurts you. Absolutely hurts you. And I'm not, and I'm against that. You really do not need, because then you have to just go back and have them add these features that they've forgotten because you don't have the experience to ask the designer what you want in the theme until you've got an audit with a professional like myself or Arson or someone else. And we're like, how much did you spend on this theme? They didn't do this, this, and this. Can you go back and have them add this in? And usually it's not possible. I, I'd say also, <clears throat> you want to make sure your developer is following WordPress, if they're building a theme for WordPress, following WordPress coding standards. Um, if they do that, then any good developer should be able to pick it up and help with things. Um, there are some companies that turn things around and make them bass backwards and like, um, I don't want to say anything bad about any companies, but um, do it. <laughs> I don't think oh, yeah, again, we're, we're not there. Uh, there are plenty of horror stories. If anyone wants to contact us privately. Actually, you know, what, you know what, I will say, actually, we have had enough clients with experiences bad enough that I will say it. I'll, I'll name this name. Uh, there's a company called They. Oh, called, oh, wow. Yeah, let's talk about They. Yeah, it's called, and, and I know we're kind of shifting from CLS stuff, but uh, um, or core web vitals, but uh, they had they basically have built things that are so custom that we can't fix it. We've literally migrated every client who we've ever worked with from a they theme to something else. And, they're and here is the and here is the hilarious thing about it. These are some of the biggest bloggers in the world. They got suckered into spending a fortune with they on these custom themes, and then they they didn't have any improvement. And then they come and they had an audit with me. And again, we'll, we'll leave the names out of it, but these people come, they have an audit. We just tear the theme apart. And so then they go back to they, they won't make the changes. No, this isn't going to help you for SEO. No, we don't need to be doing this. And so they switch and then they will actually send them an email. You are going to tank your site by doing this. And I love it because we save the emails and then we have the person email them back a year later when they triple their traffic, telling them you need to hire new development staff. Wow. We know what you're talking about. That's it, it, how bad it is. Like, you know, there's, there's, yeah. I, I don't even have words for how frustrating. You don't have words. It's fine. I got plenty of words for both of us. It's Zero all right. words. So everybody on the call, 
work with somebody else. <laughs> nothing, like taking, nothing like taking a client who's doing 100 to 250,000 on a faith theme, moving them to Genesis and have them go to 3 million sessions in a year because that's happened a lot. So that's what you're, that's what you're dealing with. So while we're on the subject of, of hiring out, let's go back to the, the core web vitals. Arson, out of everything that needs to be fixed on a potential publisher site, what task would you recommend a publisher potentially hire out instead of try and do themselves? Like maybe some of the most technical ones, or can you give any examples to kind of guide the publishers on the call, what they should focus on and what they should maybe look for help? Yeah. Um, I mean, look, if you're, if you know what you're doing, if you have a, a engineering dev background and you're comfortable modifying, you know, theme files and, and, CSS and you know working with the databases and all of that. Uh, um, there's stuff that you can do. Uh, stuff that uh, um, you do from just WordPress's interface would be. And again, if you're working with somebody like like Andrew uh, with NerdPress, a lot of this stuff is already being done for you, like you know minimizing your JavaScript and uh, uh, caching and all you know browser caching and all of that. Uh, um, are we, are, Andrew? Are you going to talk about source setting images? on this call or is there a uh, conversation? I can. Okay, well, so like- <laughs> whatever, whatever floats your boat, buddy. <laughs> no, I didn't know if it was one of the questions. Uh, uh, so like uh, uh, um, you set sizes, uh, attribution dimensions for like media, for your videos, your images, your GIFs. Uh, uh, so it doesn't uh, uh, mess around with the, you know, CLS. Uh, um, make sure your ad elements uh, uh, um, have I don't even know what how to properly like a space that's that's blocked off for the ad, right? So it's not just like it's it loads that block before the ad is actually loaded inside that block, right? Uh, so that your paragraphs are not shifting when the ad comes into uh, uh, in, into the page, right? Um, so stuff like that would is definitely going to pay dividend much, you know, as soon as the 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 Google starts uh, 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 counting core web web vitals, um, but you know, if you're not comfortable doing it, don't go in there and try to do it yourself. You, the chances are you're going to mess something up. And like, don't, don't, don't install plugins to do this also. <laughs> right. Yeah, generally, the point. first thing to do is start uninstalling plugins. Right, right. That's, that's that was another, another point. Right. Okay, go ahead. Is get rid of all that extra craft. Is that the right word? Um, all the extra stuff, like all those things that uh, those plugins that you you installed and you're not actually using the feature or you have three plugins that do kind of the same thing. All of those can add JavaScript and style sheets at the front end of the site and slow things down. So it's always a great idea to review your active plugins, um, get rid of your inactive plugins um, and really pare that down. Um, that's, that's, I think, the easiest thing you guys can do yourselves right now, especially because you know what features you need on your site the best. Um, so just doing a quick plug-in on it, I think is a good, good. Absolutely. Uh, still 117, that's the record. I haven't found any sites with more than 117 yet. It's been a while, good times. But a plug-in audit should be happening at least, like you should be reviewing your plugins at least once a month. Like you should be looking at like what's happening. Does it need to be updated? You should like anything weird, like, oh my God, what is this plugin? Why is it even here, right? <laughs> uh, 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 like by using this, you should not have anything in there that you're not using. Oh, exactly. Exactly. You can always download it later again. Like if you, if you, sorry, if you install the plugin to help with like a one specific task, right. To like move a post to a page, right. Get rid of it. You can always download it and install it again. You don't need to have it live there. Gotcha. Okay. So Andrew, what can you do to prevent cumulative layout shifts? So it's, um, some of the stuff Arson was just talking about, uh, where if you've got ads, make sure your ad network is handling that. Like I know Mediavine's working on it. I assume AdThrive is working on it. Um, so they should handle that stuff. You wanna have your ads loading below the fold. Um, actually, I saw a question from Sean. Um, a, a few people actually are asking about CLS issues on desktop instead of mobile. Um, desktop's probably red because you have above the fold ads, whereas you don't have above the fold ads on mobile. Um, I know with Mediavine also, everybody's deferring ads on mobile, which is great, but they're not deferring ads on desktop. Uh, most desktop users, that's probably not an issue because they're gonna have a faster connection. But if the ad is above the fold, that's gonna cause a layout shift. So if you're willing to take the revenue hit, <laughs> then you can get rid of those ads above the fold on desktop. <clears throat> and that's most likely going to solve it. Um, beyond that, it's, it, 
it's going to vary from site to site. If you've got Slickstream or, or if you've got a banner ad, um, that's, a, that's a common one. Uh, you know, you've got a, a, a GDPR or a cookie notice that says like, hey, we, you know, we have cookies. And if that shows up at the top and pushes your content down and that loads late in the process, that's going to cause a layout shift. Um, so one solution is to put it at the bottom, although that might interfere with sticky ads. Um, there's, or you could have something on the sidebar. Um, if you have an opt-in form, you know, get my, my new recipes, you know, and you have an email form at the top, if that loads late in the process, that's going to cause a layout shift. So you have to, you have to have a spacer in there. Uh, some plugins will be good at this and some won't. So some of that might be changing out which plugin you're using. Um, uh, beyond that, it's kind of, you have to do it on a case by case basis and really look and see, use the tools and see what's actually moving. And then you can, you can address it that way. Keith, do you think the Core Web Vitals are going to impact Google Discover traffic? That's a good question. And although Google has never said anything about it specifically, we can kind of glean some insights based upon their information that they publish about Google Discover. I'm going to paste over a link which has a ton of information about Google Discover. Uh, well worth your time. It's under Google's uh, advanced SEO module that they've launched recently. And the thing to be aware of it is that Google is very clear that Discover traffic is serendipitous. For those of you who won't know the big deal about that big word I just used, basically we can't plan for it. Google Discover is very unique. It's tied to content based upon Google's automated systems and it's matched to your own individual users, your, your use, your intents and your interests that you set up on your Google Discover feed. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and paste that over here a little bit. You can take a look at that. Now, we can't really create an optimized content for that. Therefore, I'm not really too concerned about the core web vitals impacting Discover traffic too much. Clearly, we want everything to load fast as possible. But one of the things that you want to be aware of with Google Discover, especially if you're a food or lifestyle blogger and you're on the call, is that you want to start looking in web stories. Web stories, there is a new carousel in Google Discover completely devoted to web stories. Web stories is currently going through a land rush. It's literally like the Homestead Act going through right now. People are going out and they're putting together these web stories and they went from having 1% discover traffic to five, seven to 10% within a week. There's a lot of people putting these web stories together. The problem is, is there's a very, uh, there's a, a, a kind of a correct and an incorrect way to put these web stories together. I'm gonna go ahead and put over some information in the chat in a minute about what you need to know for these web stories. But mostly these web stories are Again, and I'm not a fan of AMP, but if you're going to use AMP, only use them for the web stories. And these web stories, you download the web stories plugin from WordPress and start playing around with putting these web stories together. And you want to use some of your already top performing recipes. The web stories are all already canonicalized to the page. So there's no duplicate content or anything going on here. The goal is to use the web story to drive traffic to the actual recipe. Now on that note, I want to go ahead and talk about jump rope. I know a lot of you on the call are using jump rope. I am 100% against jump rope, and this is why. Jump rope is a great way for you to drive traffic to jump rope. Jump rope is a great way for you to drive advertising income to jump rope. Jump rope is not a way that you're going to be using to build your traffic. It's one of the most interesting things I've seen is how fast they came onto the screen. But if you've ever pulled out your phone and looked at the Discover feed, those jump ropes don't go to your site. Those jump ropes go to a jump rope channel that you've set up. So you're requiring users to click twice from that, from the jump rope to the jump rope channel, from the jump rope channel to your site. You're going to have extremely low converting traffic on that. It's just not worth your time. If you're going to use web stories, don't use jump rope. Go ahead and build up your own web stories so that we can go ahead and have them sent to your site on every frame of that web story. That's what we want to do, okay? You don't have, there is no benefit for you getting into the carousel using jump rope when you can just go ahead and start making your own web stories now and have the same visibility. So be aware of that going forward. Perfect, that's good to know. We're about to head into Q&A. So if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but over there. Um, Arson, last question to you. And this is definitely a question that comes up quite a bit. So 
if users care less about the story behind a recipe, if they're just clicking on that jump to recipe button and trying to just get what ingredients they need or the oven temperature, how can you satisfy, especially with this update coming up, both the audience giving them the recipe and Google who wants the content? Well, again, so Google, there's no such thing as content length as a ranking factor. Like it just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, it can actually have a reverse effect uh, uh, from what we're seeing, right? Uh, so you got to keep in mind, Google is really heavy on intent, right? And understanding what the intent is behind a query. Uh, and they, we, we've covered this in our previous uh, webinar. So if my, if my intent is to find a temperature to cook something like a tomahawk steak or a portobello mushroom, whatever it is, right? I'm going to go in there, I'm going to find the temperature and I'm going to get out. I'm not going to read anything else, right? My primary intent uh, uh, is to do that one thing, right? I might have secondary passive intent, uh, which focuses around like, hmm, what else can I serve it with? Maybe there's a different way of cooking this, right? But it, it might be, right? So users are going to go in, they're gonna look at the piece of content that they're interested in and they're going to leave, right? Uh, other intent will, like if I'm, if I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna make for dinner and I'm searching for uh, um, keto friendly chicken dishes without uh, cheese, I don't know, right? Uh, 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 or with bacon, right? Um, now I'm presented with a, uh, a page, whether it's a category page or it's a roundup post where I'm presented with a, a bunch of different recipes and I'm going to make my selection. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that page because I am, th that's, that's my intent, right? I'm gonna, so Google looks at that and uh, we're assuming that Google understands what, or assumes what the intent is behind that query. So I wouldn't say that you have to write long form content in order to rank. Look at the look at the big players. Look at the guys who have been winning through these last few updates. Content is short to the point addressing the primary intent, right? Uh, the primary intent is to get that recipe. And we've been preaching this, right? Prioritizing content based on intent. Uh, uh, you don't need a long story, right? Give the user what they want. And then everything that addresses secondary intent should be moved towards the bottom, right? Uh, um, focus on giving the user or, or, or matching the content to the query syntax. And the query syntax are the words in that query. If I'm looking for temperature to grill tomahawk steak, that should be the first thing that I see when I land on the page. Gotcha, okay. Now we're moving into Q and A. We've got the first question from Andrea and uh, Andrew. It looks like you're ready to answer this one live. How do you improve LCP and FCP? Okay, so um, LCP is largest contentful paint. We haven't really talked about that one much. Um, and FCP is first contentful paint. Uh, first contentful paint means it's basically the first thing that gets drawn on the page. Um, largest is the largest thing, and this is within the viewport. So basically before you scroll, and we're talking mobile, right? So if it's on your mobile phone, whatever the, the first thing to appear is, is the first contentful paint. Whatever the biggest thing to appear is, is the largest. And uh, the web vitals are really focusing on largest contentful paint with the assumption that if it's bigger on the page, it's more important for the visitor. Um, so it's all the standard page speed recommendations to fix these. Um, you need to basically be on a fast host. Uh, you need to have page caching enabled. You know, if you're generating content on the fly, it's going to take too long. Um, you need to defer style sheets and JavaScript. Um, uh, using critical path CSS is really important. Um, critical path CSS basically embeds the, the styling that's needed to re render just above the fold content, actually putting it in the HTML document so that when that document comes back, the browser has that style information already. It doesn't have to then make a query for another style sheet and get that back. It's still going to do that for the rest of the page, but it's already drawing the stuff at the top in the beginning. This stuff is really important for user experience, um, particularly because up until this point, the user is staring at a white screen. And if that takes two seconds, it feels a, like a long time. Um, if, if, you, you know, if you shave off two seconds, you wanna do it from the beginning of your load process, not at the end, right? Once there's something there for the visitor to look at, if it takes an extra second or two, it doesn't matter as much. It feels faster because the user sees stuff happening. So if you can get that stuff to happen really fast, um, using a content distribution network is really important. Um, so for example, with our services, we use Cloudflare. Um, we use, we have an enterprise configuration now. We're caching HTML at Cloudflare. So we can, once it's cached, we'll return that HTML document to the visitor in under 50 milliseconds, no matter where they are in the world. 
And then all of the other static assets can be returned really fast from Cloudflare as well. So when you really start getting into this stuff, there's lots and lots of layers. Um, so some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, like getting rid of extra plugins, like you wanna get rid of all that bloat first and then optimize the other things. Um, our primary tool is WP Rocket. That it's a premium plugin. We include that with our plans as well. So that will do most of what I just mentioned. So we couple that with the CDN. We make sure somebody's on good hosting like Big Scoots or Agathon. Um, you take all of those things together and that should really make a significant improvement on both your uh, first Contentful Paint and Largest. Um, one other weird thing about Largest Contentful Paint is it can vary from page to page. So we've seen this a lot where, let's say you have a really short post title um, and then you have another post with a really long post title which wraps onto two lines that becomes a bigger element. And if that pushes an image down, like you could have a different largest contentful paint on each of those pages and you could have a significant, significantly different speed. Uh, so if you run, test the two pages, one might be two seconds, one might be six seconds. And it's because it's loading something different or it's looking at something different that loads at a different point in the sequence. So we've seen that where if you have a weird discrepancy where some pages are very different, that you have to actually look at that thumbnail image and, and look at what's changed. Um, and, um, that can, yeah, that can make a big difference. So you got, you got to kind of, you have to dig into this stuff and really, you know, unfortunately there's a learning curve here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the other options then hire people. Um, I think it's still, I think it's important to hire experts once you hit your, your limit, um, but it's also important to understand what you're hiring them for so you can make sure they're doing a good job and you can talk with them, you know, smartly about it and make sure they're actually doing right by your site. And I, I do yeah. want to add one thing. Sorry, let me let me jump in. So, and I'm noticing this in the comments. Like, how how who do I hire to fix X Y Z? Right? Uh, don't approach it that way. Don't look for help with fixing a specific thing that you got from a tool that's telling you this is what you need. This is just a suggestion. A tool is still just a tool. And I've said this before. You need somebody who really understands what's happening just because, and then keep in mind, uh, the tool is looking at it on a page level, not the entire site as a whole level, right? So it's telling you this piece of JavaScript is not being used here on this page, right? But it could be being used somewhere else. So going to a developer and saying, please remove this JavaScript specifically for that, you might cause harm. You need to work with someone who really understands what they're doing. They can uh, audit is a scary word with us, but uh, somebody who can audit uh, 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 your, 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 you know, the situation of, of, of you know, your CLS or, or any core web vital situation, right, that you're, you're, you're having, and then tell you, yeah, this is something that should be fixed, or this is something that should be optimized, or this should be left alone. Okay. Um, it looks like, Casey, you're ready to answer Palin's question. I have a problematic theme, which has just been recommended that I switch ASAP. However, it was just mentioned not to switch theme in Q4, which you all recommended. When might be a good time to switch themes? Yeah, Palin has signed up for an audit. So in this case, do not listen to what we just said. You, to switch. <laughs> you have a theme that is, again, I, I, again, I don't want to call you out, but you're you're riding an Edsel and we need to get you switched to a Ferrari and your theme is so bad that any improvement we make is going to be phenomenal for you. So that's just for her situation, folks. Okay. So just be aware of that. That's why I wanted to answer it quickly here. Uh, if you have any questions on that, we've been trading emails. You've already also been in touch with uh, Skylar. You're in good hands. The faster we can get you converted, the better. And Adam Hunter, who had the same question, it, it just goes to show it, it's really going to come down to having an expert evaluate your site and make sure. That's exactly it. I mean, if you want to have, you know, like I said, this is the busy time. Uh, if your traffic is okay and you're, you're doing okay and, you know, we don't need to make any dramatic changes. I'll, I visited with a client today. Andrew knows who that client is. They, she's a current subscriber. She has issues with her theme, but she is doing very well. There is no reason for us to upseat an Apple cart or do anything dramatic right now as we go into a busy period just to switch themes. But if your site is throwing up errors on every page and your page speed is non-existent and you have schema issues and literally, again, your, your theme looks like that was put together by a, a four-year-old we need to make some changes, okay? And again, don't take any of this stuff personally, but our goal is to get you to provide you the best advice, but that advice is relative to the site we're looking at. 
Perfect. Okay. Um, let's see. We only have time for a couple more questions. Let's go to Katie with Google Web Stories. Should we create these recipes that are already performing well, say on page one, or focus on other recipes that are sitting on page two, three, et cetera? And feel free, anyone who's comfortable. Yeah, the uh, I'll just I'll take this very quickly to Katie because I did answer her in the chat already. I, I would say that in your case, let's just focus. This is a completely different channel. So it doesn't matter if you focus on another recipe, it's not really gonna have a benefit on that algorithmically. This is a completely different channel for Discover, it's web stories. So I would advise you to focus on your best content first. Let's take that, your best content on your site, convert it to web stories and see if we can get it to do just as well on a different channel, the web stories carousel as it's doing already algorithmically in Google with organic search. I would wanna take a recipe that's not doing well in organic search and try to convert it to a web story Already, no reason. No, go with strength. Strength goes with strength with regards to web stories. Makes sense. And opening up just two more questions. Uh, this question from Tammy to and feel free any of you guys who want to respond to this. Uh, my CLS on mobile seem to alternate between green and red on mobile for every post, but on desktop, they're all poor. I have MV ads and I'm running the feast plugin. Why do I have such discrepancies? First of all, I, and I want Andrew and Arson to, to speak on this, I do not believe that Google is using desktop at all for core web vitals, at all, at all. I think that they're doing it because they wanna provide us both the information, but everything with Google is mobile first. It is my belief, unless, I, unless someone can show me a quote from Google otherwise, I wouldn't even lose any sleep over the desktop, nor would I even concentrate any resources on that. I would focus everything on mobile first, because I don't believe that you improving your core web vitals on desktop is going to be mean is going to mean anything because we're using the mobile first version of your site for all metrics. Right. So unless someone tells me differently for all of you on the call, getting poor core web vitals for desktop, I would ignore them completely. Don't even worry about them. And, and just to add to that, I get the same thing. I, I run, I was I've been running our website top hat rank through both desktop and mobile. And uh, yeah, it varies. Why? I don't know. Uh, um, content shifts, you have a responsive layout versus a desktop layout. Uh, but I really don't care what's happening in the desktop version. Um, I only care. Um, I've got the notification that I'm mobile first with Google. Uh, I don't care about desktop at this point. Now, Tammy's asking specifically on mobile about alternating between green and red on posts too. So like, it's also like there's this weird fickleness in the reporting, right? Um, okay. And I think there's a lot of variation here. Um, and that's using real world data. So if you happen to have a different post that goes viral with different users who are on slower connections, like that stuff actually can move the needle. Um, right. Because we're talking about very subtle differences sometimes, you know, so you do have to still take some of this with a grain of salt. What you want to do is see improvement in general. And I think if you're doing that, you're going to be in good shape. Okay, final question. And don't worry if you didn't get your question answered in Q&A. In the recap, um, Casey, Andrew, and Arson go through any of the questions that weren't answered and make sure that they get answered. So everything will get addressed in the recap post. But last question. Yeah, just one quick thing, because I definitely don't want to leave Laura hanging here. Laura has a great question. Does sidebar content affect the shifting? Do we even need a sidebar if we are optimizing for mobile first? Yes, you need a sidebar. Please do not remove your sidebar. If you remove your sidebar, you're going to have ranking drops because you're removing strong site-wide signals to Google that you had a lot of links on that. I know this site, I know your site specifically, Laura. Don't do that. Uh, we don't see sidebars on mobile, so no, it's not having an impact on your CLS issues most likely. There are other things in play. So just very quickly there, I want to make sure that we got that answered. Perfect. Thank you, Casey. Uh, Kim's question, she's using Feast plugin, doesn't have any ads yet, and mobile pages are green light, according to GSC. But desktop pages definitely need improvement. Casey just mentioned, don't worry about desktop. Yeah, pages. don't worry about that. But mobile's good. So she's trying to figure out what is different between the two and whether or not that they can be duplicated. She can duplicate what she's doing on mobile with desktop so that it'll get approved by GSC. I think we, we touched on that for Sean's as well. It's most likely ads on desktop. So get rid of your, if you really want to fix this, which we don't think you need to, but if you really want to, uh, you get rid of your ads above the fold and you can also, um, uh, oh, you don't have ads, sorry. Um, <clears throat> there's probably something else on desktop that's doing it or obviously, but probably doesn't matter. Yeah, um, if, you know, 
Having said that, if you have a large percentage of your traffic, like your human traffic, that is using a desktop version of your site, then that's another story. Like it's not only about search engine rankings, right? It's about real world users. So, you know, for most of our audience, the, you know, most of you guys, you're going to have 70 to 80% of your traffic on mobile. So that's why we're really pushing mobile. And that's why Google pushes mobile. But if your site is a different topic that attracts a desktop audience, then you need to, do, you know, tweak things slightly differently. Uh, Katie's quick question about the sidebar. You're fine, Katie. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, great. Well, that wraps up the sixth episode of SEO for Publishers. Again, we are going to have a recap post that's going to have this replay, the transcript, links to all the resources, especially everything that was in chat, which KP, Arson, Andrew, thank you for sharing all this detailed info and including the resources in the chat. Attendees from all over the world. Thank you. Us. It's absolutely amazing to have you with us every yeah, single Yeah, I can't believe I, my wife doesn't even like to listen to me talk. So it's always shocking when we do one of these and someone can actually stay awake for an hour to listen to all of us speak. So we really appreciate it. We wish you guys a very happy and safe Thanksgiving. Try to keep those gatherings small and uh, we'll see you in December. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone.